forward and like that. All right. We'll be dark, but it's okay. So I'll say the opening prayer, then we'll start. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, the Lord that we are present and filling all things, the treasury of all blessings, and the giver of life, come and dwell within us. Bring from every impurity, cleanse us, and save our souls from the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. So this evening, I thought I would in fact, do a recording and uh, spend 45 minutes, you can keep me, uh, keep me on time. Um, oh, I need to uh, reply to Gabriel. Okay. Um, to talk about this book that I wrote many, many years ago, called This Broken Body, Understanding and Healing the Schism Between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Churches. It's a large book, and nobody wants to read the book, it's very large, and it's okay. Um, so I thought I would just give a crash course of what this book says, what it's about. In part because uh, when you talk to people about being Orthodox, they will often ask Greek or Russian, to which you can reply Eastern or Greek or Russian, whatever you want to reply, or just Orthodox Christian. In America, Catholic has become Roman Catholic. Um, but what, and some people, so, so it's like the Catholic Church, but without the Pope, is that what it is? I mean, it's that often <laughs> that's what a way to, to kind of or it was the same church for a thousand years and then it's split over you know beards and the crusades or something like that so and in general it's hard to avoid that the the cathedral is so big and as such a visible figurehead or leader the pope whoever he might be and it's also a country vatican city holy see right it's a country with u.n membership and uh, uh an issue sometimes, right, pronouncements, maybe scandals, that we are affected by it. And often Orthodox Christians don't really know how to relate with the Catholic Church. Especially, so I'll give examples, uh, Greek Orthodox Christians who are from Greece, just, you know, come from a Greek family, they simply just don't care. You ask them, they just don't care. I mean, it's not that it's bad, it's just that I just don't care. They have their own Christian lives, they're happy with it. Uh, and they would think, well, uh, I mean, they're Italian, they're French, they're fine. I mean, uh, we disagree, but they don't really care that much because uh, they just live their own Christian lives. They don't really judge, they're not attempted to join, just uh, say, we're just different. God will sort things out, which maybe it's one way to, to say it. Um, and then you have had regions where there was conflict, bitter, bitter historical conflict. So um, in Serbia, if you ask the same question, you know, Serbian Orthodox or Croat Catholic, then you have very strong sentiment, reaction, enmity. They were killing each other in horrible ways just seven years ago. And then you have, in America in particular, but elsewhere, people who convert to orthodoxy from all kinds of backgrounds. Adventist, and Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, uh, Calvary Chapel, you know, all kinds of backgrounds. And those backgrounds carry a, a variable amount of really strong anti-Catholic sentiment. I mean, for example, someone was an Adventist in their youth, uh, you're taught that the, the Antichrist, you know, is the Pope, basically, uh, the, you know, Babylon is the Church of Rome, and so when you become Orthodox, it's easier, first of all, it's not Catholic, but you maintain a very strong anti-Catholic uh, gut reaction, um, sometimes for valid reasons. So for example, uh, I was doing uh, my wife's uh, genealogy, 
She, had an, she has an ancestor who was in the 1500s, a Catholic priest in Italy, uh, left the Catholic Church to become a reformer, a Protestant, basically. He was arrested, put in prison, had to escape, went to the Italian northern uh, region where the, the, the Catholics, uh, the Kingdom of Savoy, it was called, I guess, uh, really persecuted, massacred, impaled these poor people. Uh, and they became the Waldesians, and then you have the Mennonites. So these people, they have, a, they, in their history is like it's strong anti-Catholic feeling because of those real catastrophes, right? And so the idea is to how do we sort things out right? rationally? Also because there's such a fine line sometimes, you know, between good and bad. I always say you know, sometimes like your temperature at 98 is great, at 102 is bad. I mean, and it's a small change, right? It's like on the radio, you switch to like just a bit, and you go from beautiful music to, to awful chaos. And it is true with, with leadership in the church. So, uh, we'll take Peter for example. If Peter uh, would say, hey, you know, I am the first uh, of the apostles, to me the Lord gave the keys, and uh, I, I was called to be the rock, blah, blah, blah. That's true. That's true. And then if he said, uh, you know, therefore everybody must obey me, uh, uh, and be under my rule, or people will be damned, it might be true, though I doubt that it is, but it, see, you see, it's just a change of tone. You know, same with the Book of Rome, who could say, oh, I'm the first among the bishops, and you know, that's the way it's always been for you know. Therefore, you know, sub submit to my ultimate power judgment, then you're not in the church and you all go to hell. So, it's quick to go from Apostle in the Bible to Satan, right? In the case of Peter, you're a Peter upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, and I give you the keys, and then you go down two verses, get behind me, Satan. Same scene, just a few uh, minutes may have arrived. So, there's a fine line, and it's true within orthodoxy, uh, between what a bishop may say about himself, or even a priest, and then suddenly you go into the danger zone. And that's part of, 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 of that discerning of the boundaries. So the book uh, came uh, because I myself wanted to know what to do, to be frank. You know, before you have kids, you decide what, to, what you're going to be. And that it would make sense rationally. And, and I heard arguments on both sides, like books, you know, people publish books. Often the people convert to one side, and then within two years write a book about it. I think it's a bad idea. People should wait. Uh, people that are new converts are the worst people, I think, to write a book, really. But um, like to make a case for it, to make a case for what you believe. Call apologetics. It's, I'm right, you're wrong, and I've got 50 pages of, of quotes. I can just cut and paste to the internet, and here it is. And I read those books, and you could read one book. It's like the the, the Jewish, you know, or the Jewish uh, uh, joke where you read, oh, you're right, and you read the other side, oh yeah, you're right too. Some says, but they can't both be right. Oh, you're right. Yes, kind of a Jewish joke. <laughs> that you have to decide how could it be that sometimes you feel that way. So you read something, yeah, that's all right. The other side, yeah, that looks all right too. And then you have to decide. And so when I began this, this research, I was in a seminary at the time to read. I had hard both, both sides. And then when I really read the sources, they actually made the effort, I want to read these early church people. And when there's doubt, uh, I'm going to ask, is this spurious? Is this a fake source? Or is this something that is truly from the claimed author? Because sometimes with these early documents, you really have to ask the question. I was telling my son, St. Thomas Aquinas, God bless him, but 
he wrote um, a book called Against the Errors of the Greeks. So it was after the schism, and he writes this whole book to show that the Greeks and Orthodox are wrong. And he quotes from John Chrysostom and all these, you know, ancient uh, authorities. But poor St. Thomas Aquinas did that his source book of quotes, it was spurious. He said that 80% or 90% were fake. Back then, I mean, you know, it was possible. You, you, you had no access to the internet, you couldn't actually visualize ancient manuscripts that had been digitized. And he wrote a book that is m most fake quotes. To this day, it's kind of an embarrassment. Now some argue, well, yeah, they are fake. <laughs> But he could have used authentic ones and kind of, could have made the same point. See, that is a problem. I remember reading a book um, about Christmas. You know, was Jesus born December 20th, 25th? And the author puts a quote from St. Hippolytus of Rome, so near 200 or so, really early. And sometimes you, 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 you get a, a smell for it. Like, hmm, this is not a book. Like it's from the 200. But it's, it takes work. You have to track the source. Sometimes today people put a URL, but that's no good. You have to put the URL. So where is that in the collections, right? And then you have to look and see if it's authentic. Or what. It's not easy, it's hard work. Or when there's a translation. Sometimes, you know, the Greek language, uh, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> There's the Latin mindset to translate something, and then there's, I think, more the Greek mindset to translate something in the same text. So in the, Greek, in the Latin, Roman, kind of more legalistic mindset, something is valid or not. Is this a valid sacrament or not? Is this a valid order or not? It's kind of the law, right? Either you are in or you're out. So the term valid is very important to Roman Catholics. And there is a text uh, in the early, early writings so from St. Ignatius near 1, I don't know, 160 maybe AD, uh, something like that, even earlier, maybe 140, 150. So very early, right? An apostolic man who knew the apostles. And he says, only consider it valid the Eucharist which has been celebrated by the bishop or his delegate. Well, the, the, the Greek word is bebeia, and I really think it means assure. And, and there's a difference, right? Because assurance, to me, is much less yes or no. You're more or less assured that something is, is going to happen. There's a probability. So and the idea is that as you go to the Eucharist, which the bishop, and there was only typically one back then, right? A, a bishop that came from the apostles, that could literally show his pedigree, his, his diploma, right? It's like, hey, uh, the apostle Philip ordained me, here's his, the, the paperwork. Or if, if it was that well, you know, the bishop so and so ordained me, uh, and the three others, but they were ordained by this apostle. So there was this, this right? In one town, there was one bishop. And his helpers, the presbyters, in fact, he was one of them, the elders. And the idea was only, you only have an assurance that you are in the Eucharist with Christ, joined to him, if you go to that, you know, that gathering. He said, because there's other Christian groups, you know, that have broken away over God knows what dispute. Um, and if you go there, you have either zero assurance or diminishing assurance that this is the right thing. I think that's a really big question because um, I think it's truth for us today. We want to go where we have the most assurance that it's what Christ wants. It's a simple idea, right? If you're a Christian, you know that he's alive, he's rose from the dead, he's operating, he's at work, he's bringing the world to something, though sometimes we don't know what it is, right? but he has a mind, a will for Christians, how they should do things, behave, be, and you want to be on board that program. So you want to have that assurance. So I, I would say that in any place, I have, that's the word, there's diminishing assurance that this is the right thing. 
I'll give you an example of it. So say you go to a Christian gathering on a Sunday, and you bring with you St. Ignatius from the year 140 with you, ordained by the Apostles with his mindset, and you bring him around, and you go to a place, I'm not going to give names in the recap, but, and you enter, and in fact there's even no Eucharist <laughs> that Sunday. They don't even do it because it's boring, repetitive, but you can come every other week, Thursday night, somewhere where it will be done with Wonder Bread and little tiny plastic cups of fruit juice. He would say, well, there's zero assurance. There's not even the Eucharist. I don't even pretend there to be one. And then you could go to the other place where maybe there is a Eucharist of some kind. But he would ask, okay, but who ordained these people? I mean, do they meet the qualifications that we set up, that Christ set up, that the apostles received? So maybe there's more assurance, a little bit more, you move from 0% to, right? But the question I would always, where is that assurance that the church is there? That we may be there, that we may plug into that. So, so that was my reflection, right? Ultimately. So, to, to make a long story short, I first realized that the way we use the word church can only be defined in the way the scriptures define the word church. We can't make up our own definitions. So, if we're going to be serious, let's go to every, to the, every verse in the New Testament where the word church is used. And lo and behold, uh, there's also the word churches. So you have to say, okay, there's, you know, on Sunday there's one church, there's one body, one Christ, okay. But the word churches, plural, appears. So there's the one church, this cross is one body, and then there's churches, and that's okay. And the Bible seems to say it's okay, there's churches. But you realize, if you look at every verse, is that it's always the church in one town. You look, right? Church which is at Corinth, church which is at Thessaloniki, church which is at Rome, at Antioch, at Jerusalem, one church in one city. Okay, makes perfect sense. And that church in that city was called the Catholic Church, which in Greek means Catalan, which has the wholeness, the fullness of what is required. So there was the, not a, there was the Catholic Church at Rome. The Catholic Church at Jerusalem, the Catholic Church at Corinth, the Catholic Church in a town. But in the New Testament, in a region, say called Ikea, which is called Greece basically, or Asia Minor, you have churches. Makes sense. A region, churches, in each town, the church, not even a church. What you couldn't have, which really made no sense, is either is to have two churches in one town. It's exactly what Jesus did not want. So what does he want? I think it's, just, it's very clear. He wants to bring unity of, the, of those that are called out into himself. And so in every town there should have been one Eucharist and not one at Elia, not one at, at, uh, at 11, you know, one for the youth with the guitars, one at, at 11 for the elderly, one gathering with one loaf, one cup, and everybody rich, poor, every race, you know, is in the same place, the same womb in a way, and communes in the same body and blood. That's unity. Uh, the many become one. The, the, the strangers become brothers, sisters, because they have the same blood, which they receive in the chalice. And in fact, St. Ignatius, who was Bishop of Antioch, mentioned the apostolic man, who was arrested by the Romans, he is taken from Antioch of Syria to Rome to be eaten by lions. So his icon is him eaten by lions. There's two lions up and down. Um, and he writes letters on the way to Rome from, from the boat, literally. And we have these letters where he says it's according to the mind of Christ. That's important. 
that in every town should be bishops. Now, bishop is epis episcopos. Right? Episcopos means overseer, someone who watches over. And it's clear when you read that in every town were men chosen to be elders, presbyters. And elder refers to the fact that you can be 18 <laughs> and be, especially in that culture, but I think to this very day even more, you can't be trusted with wisdom if you're 18 years old. And historically, even Christ was 30 when he did his, his, his ministry, right? It's when, it's when uh, in the Bible, a man could become a priest at 30 years old. So from the gathering of the people, the apostles who had been chosen by Christ would arrive in town or, or their delegates and they would choose men and they would ordain by laying on of hands presbyters and deacons. Book of Acts. Now, in the New Testament, elder, presbyter, presbyteros, right? Uh, and episcopos, or bishop overseer is always interchangeable because only an overseer is the function that you do, you oversee things. And presbyter elder is, is your qualification. You must be a man of, of good age uh, who is credible and who is able to perform the function to be an overseer. So that is the same thing in the New Testament. But among the presbyters, one is the first. It's always been like that. I think that's what the Jewish mindset is that you can't have chaos, you have to have order. When the presbyters are gathered to perform the Eucharist, who will preside? Simple question. Right? There has to be an order. And to this day, if I go to, to a big town, there's many priests, and we start the liturgy, we know in what order it functions. Is there a bishop? He's first. Is there three bishops? Then who is first among them? By age, by rank, whatever they have, you know, it's very set. But so in Jerusalem, for example, you can say there were elders, presbyters, Acts 15. Of these elders, presbyters, one was what will be called later the bishop overseer, which is the first among them, was James. And in early church history, Eusebius tells a story, I think it's very credible, that the Lord appeared to the apostles after his resurrection and commanded to Peter, James, and John, three, three apostles, to lay hands on James, his brother, meaning the son of Joseph by his previous marriage, so the, his older brother, half brother, not uterine brother, right? He's called the brother of the Lord in the Bible. For that reason, say, he will be the first bishop of Jerusalem. And ever since that, that, that day, bishops are ordained by three bishops. Which is a great way to protect the office. Because it takes three bishops, nearby bishops, not from you know, Africa and Siberia, and, uh, to gather and consecrate this one bishop. There are stories in the early church of you know, getting the old, older bishops to drink a bit too much uh, sweet Italian wine and then, you know, to try to make bishops that way. And that was... But that, it rarely happened. It meant that the office was protected. And also in our practice to this day, when the bishops are consecrating a presbyter as a bishop, the people have to be there and to say, he's worthy. To this day, you can go to Orish and, and the people are saying Greek, it's very old. You have to either say, Axios is worthy to become a bishop, huh? or Anaxios is not worthy, in which case, uh, it's game over for the, the service. So there is an input from the people. And so that's what I discovered. So in fact, our sense of church, church is not a building, church is not, in fact, uh, the church in Greece. No, no, it's churches in Greece. It's not, in fact, even the Catholic Church in the world, right? All it's churches. 
And each of them is the Catholic Church if it has particular qualities. And that, of course, is against our mind. We always think of parts and whole. Oh, you get all these things and then you have a church. You know, you always think that you have parts and whole, but it doesn't work that way. Every part, every city church was the whole church. And in the book I talk about the, the hologram as being exactly that. Uh, we have that in our modern day physics. You take a hologram image, it's a film, and there's an encoding on the film, and you shine a light and say, you know, Princess Leia or some other thing comes out of the, the, the film. Right? And if you cut the film in half and you shine your light, you still have the whole. And you cut that in half, and you have four pieces, you shine, you still have the whole. There's the whole in every part. Now, if you really reduce to a very small piece of film, it will be much fuzzier. There's less information, but it still is the whole. That's the idea. So, so that was really my discovery. Now, in the, the local church, right, the presbyters, elders, priests, uh, stand and wait for the apostles. And among them, the first, the we were called bishop later on, but just have you know, the first, the chief, is the bishop, Peter. So who is the head of the Catholic Church in the ancient mindset? Peter. Now, who are these presbyters? They're the apostles. So is Peter just the first among equals? No. My bishop is not the first among equals. He has some authority over us. But you see, once you apply what I call the imperial Roman model to the church, you say, well, well, no, 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 the church is not the whole in every town. It's, we take the empire centered in Rome, and there will be, that will be the church, and there will be a single head like the emperor, or a single pontiff, and he will be Peter for the whole church, understood wrongly as one of the imperial, the imperial. World. And so this shift from the church as being the whole in every city, where Peter, the bishop is the chief, is then translated to this universal view. And when that happens, then suddenly, if you claim to be Peter, the chief, then you rule over the whole world. And so that is, that is what happened. It was a shift in the, in the sense that the whole, the Catholic Church is a local reality to an imperial reality, an international, worldwide reality. And to this day, that's the main difference between the two as far as the church is concerned. You know, either you have only, only one bishop in the Catholic Church, but that's the whole world church, Bishop of Rome. And that's his you, he's bishop of all bishops. He's only the only real bishop, in a sense. He can appoint, depose, judge, change. He's the bishop. Or you have one bishop in the Catholic Church, but it means the local church, the city church. Which for us in San Francisco extended to Eureka. We don't have enough men here to have. I wish we had 2,000 people on Sunday, of which we would have enough to have priests, presbyters, and a bishop of Eureka, would be great. But since we can't, then I'm the, the deputy, right? I extend the, the bishop's Eucharist to Eureka. And in fact, the, the bishop signs the altar cloth on which we serve the liturgy. And that's the big difference. And so when our Catholic friends see Peter in their minds, they think Pope of Rome. It's inseparable. When they think Catholic Church, they think the whole worldwide church, all believers alive today on earth. And it's, and it's, and it's an easy model, actually. it's very easy. But when the early church, the scriptures, the, the, the early two fathers who understood, you know, church, they, the city church. When they thought Peter, they thought the bishop. Unity of the church, Peter the bishop is an, an 
in every town, you find the authentic mission. So a schism was really when in one town, suddenly you had two claimants to be the bishop of the town. And that happened at some point. Right? So Rome had this case where there was two claimants to be bishop of Rome. They're called anti popes to this day, right? Um, you had the case in Antioch where there was an Arian bishop and there was a, uh, a bishop that we thought was the, the legitimate bishop and there was a bishop that Rome and the West endorsed. You can have three bishops in one city. That's a schism in the church. And Saint Basil, when we read all the prayers ten times a year, caused schisms in the church to cease. He lived it. He knew Antioch, and there were two bishops, three in fact. He knew it was, it was it's awful. It's against the mind of Christ. When the bishops had their first ecumenical council at Nicaea, 325, you can read all their decisions, and they tried everything they could to say there must be one bishop in the Catholic Church, meaning the local church, in the church. So, you know, they really tried to say, well, we have this guy, comes to be a bishop, we kind of, but we want them to be reunited. So they can all come back to us under under our bishop, right? And then him who was the bishop, well, we'll make him a bishop maybe in the village, and then when he dies, it will be over. They find ways, but it was the, the goal there should be one bishop, one Eucharist in the church in the city, because that's what Christ wants. Or in Antioch with Saint Basil. The two bishops who were competing agreed that whoever died first, then the flocks would reunite and they would continue on with one bishop. So when there was a schism between uh, East and West, now we're going to fast forward to the year 1054, right? The Great Schism, what happens? Well, there's churches in the East, speak Greek mostly, churches in the West, speak Latin mostly, and they acquired some distinctive things. Are they really super big? Well, in the East, as you can see, <laughs> priests have a beard, or at least an attempt at a beard. In the West, Roman culture, for them, that was just a big deal. <clears throat> or in the Latin West, they thought that the Eucharist should be a leaven bread. They have their arguments. The East thought, no, 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 the Eucharist is is the risen Christ, it should be leavened bread. That was a big cause of dispute. Or, I think more seriously, you know, the, the Latins felt that since the bishops are the apostolic successors, not the priests, but remember the Pope is Peter, the bishops are the apostles, what are the priests then? They don't really have the same power, so they can't chrismate or confirm. And that became a, a, a conflict when they were meeting in like, Bulgaria. For the Eastern Church, Orthodox Church today, you know, the bishop is Peter, the apostles are the presbyters, the presbyters can certainly confirm, right? And it's perfectly fine. So see, there was all these little things were beginning to create friction when they were meeting each other, like Bulgaria, for example. So, and then there was a debate over the Trinity, which is kind of a complex topic, but you know, the Westerns, the Latins felt that the creed should say that the, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, filial quay. They felt that it made, uh, it made uh, things more defensible against Arianism. But the, the text that was written in the year 381 said, no, the Spirit proceeds from the Father. Which is from the Gospel of John, actually. So there was then also a d debate over the Trinity, which was getting theological. But mostly over all of these things, these churches, these two. In fact, you know, the image of lungs is not a bad image. Because a lung is made of cells. Right? And so you really had a lung that was kind of a Greek lung with cells were the local churches, some of these towns, and a Latin lung in the West, Latin language. Kind of different, different kind of cells, you know, but the church. And, and the, the master, two of the master cells, you know, the big ones, are in schism. Church of Rome is longer in communion with the Church of Old Rome, uh, New Rome, Constantinople. But they're still churches, aren't they? 
They disagree. There's some now, there's some differences. There's still churches. God is still at work in spite of our insanity. But we think that they become more defective. I would say even in the West, in the East, things are somewhat defective. But for, from the mind of the Orthodox, there are some defects enter more the, the, the Latin church. For example, the baptism is by sprinkling, right? not by triple immersion as was done. Um, and then, in the past, you know, children were right away confirmed and then given the Eucharist. That stops in the West for different reasons because they want they want the bishop to confirm, so they have to wait for him to come. He's not coming. Well, so now we're going to we'll commune the child at six, seven, you know, and then later on comes the bishop to confirm it. It's rearranged the ancient order of the sacraments. It used to be, you know, baptism by immersion, triple immersion, right away confirmation, chrismation, and right away Eucharist. Boom. Right. So, is it? A defect, it's a change that can, you know, it's, it's just, there could be small defects, I don't know, if you decide how big they are, uh, ultimately why you make your own sense. But uh, these two laws, so to speak, evolve, uh, evolve, uh, and eventually there's attempts to reunite them, the Greeks and the Latins, they're not called yet Catholic and Orthodox, they're called Latins and Greeks, trying to work it out, 1200, 1400s, but eventually, they form two separate organs, right? So the, what we call the Roman Catholic Church, and the Eastern Orthodox Churches, right, which have a different kind of structure. But I think, fundamentally, it's like, what is the church? What's the, yeah, how is it organized? Now, in the Eastern system, you know, the local church has a head, the bishop. What about a region like Egypt? You know, you should always know who among you is the first. But you see, there was a sense that, so in a family, which is a divine unit, right, the father, husband is the, is the head of the family. Right. Now, there might be a club of men in which the men choose, determine a, a mayor or a chief, okay? Now, the role of the mayor or the chief or the CEO, whatever you want to call the president, is not the same as the husband, father, and his family. There are two different roles. So in the early church, the bishop said, yes, we're going to decide among us who's going to have some responsibilities, what he's going to do. So typically, like in Egypt, it would be the main city, Alexandria. The bishop there was going to be first among his, his, his fellow bishops. And they would agree that they don't do important things without his, his consent. He doesn't do anything without their consent. It's kind of an ideal picture, but that's what's the, the project. For Rome, the bishops gave to Rome particular privileges as the first seat. Because you see, if, if the bishop is in, in the chair of Peter in his church, right, in any place, well, the bishop who is in Rome where Peter died, at a particular Petri radiance and glow. And, you know, so you're going to choose one to have a particular role, you know, then he would be a good choice. It's the capital too. But we're also the most generous church, a stable church. So the historic of the bishops gave to the Bishop of Rome particular privileges as the first among the bishops. At some point that broke because he saw himself as being the only truly Peter. So when you see at a council like uh, Ephesus 431, there's a, a priest from, am I out of time? Yeah. Almost, okay. Yeah. When uh, you see a priest like Philip, who represents the Sea of Rome at this great council, and he says, you know, Pope Leo, or in Pope Leo, uh, Peter uh, presides still in his sea. For the Greeks, yeah, it's true of all the bishops. But in the Roman mind, it becomes only true of them. Or when Pope Leo writes, you know, uh, Peter still rules today in the rulers of the churches. They think it means just the Church of Rome. But for the Greeks, yeah, true, sure, all the bishops, especially there were other Petrine sees, right? Uh, Alexandria, Antioch, or also Petrine. So, so you see, you, you, start, you start speaking the same word, and they mean different things. 
And for Rome, then, they became the only Peter, and therefore the only true head of the church. So that's what happened. So I say to, to some people are very like, uh, well, you know, then, what does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean? Well, I think, I think God is working with us still. I think that some of the defects uh, can be very bad. Some liturgical defects can be very bad. Um, where you kind of start questioning, you know, is God still able to work? It's so, so defective, you know. Um, but ultimately, I think that's what we need to understand. Right? What happened and then how we relate and we can talk about it things, or purgatory, and indulgences, and other things, but that's fundamentally what took place. And then the authority becomes a big question. Right? In the Roman mind, the Pope says it's going to be fine anyways, his Peter speaks for God. In the East, it's more complicated. You have all these bishops, and they have kind of to, to agree on things. Right? So, on the one side, you have this more effective system, one power can do anything he wants. In the East, you can't really change much, which is both a good and a bad thing. Right. There you go. So, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. If you have a question on any of this, feel free to ask. I kept to my 45 minutes, though. Yeah. I have a question about yeah. um, the Orthodox Church in America. Yeah. Um, Why the name Orthodox Church when it's not a church, first of all? It's a metropolia. Yeah. And, you know, like one city you can have many bishops yeah all the different jurisdiction yeah the it's it's wrong yeah. it's a defect would that ever like in a practical sense in our lifetimes would we ever see that kind of resolve i hope so mm -hmm. i doubt it i think that you know sin is a disease that can be contained but not suppressed so i think that in general disintegration Continues. Look at the map of the world. There were 50 countries, you know, in 1940. There's 200 countries, and there'll be probably more. People, things break apart. That's what sin does. It disintegrates families, countries, churches. And so I'm not an optimist in that sense. Mm -hmm. But it's wrong, and they know it because they wrote that they want to fix it one day, and blah blah blah. You know, I'd like. To, it could be in two minutes they could solve it by saying, "Hey, I take Oakland. You take Sacramento. I take San Francisco." Done. Why won't they do it? Silly. But you're right. That's it. It's, it's not the case in Greece or in Russia or in these ancient lands, but in America, it is a problem. And if they were to, you know, <coughs> solve that like that, because um, there's a lot of Orthodox churches in America that don't speak English during the liturgy, would that have to no, change? No, because a, a parish reflects the needs of whoever is there. So you could have, you know, a, like there's still many immigrants from Ukraine, mm -hmm. so you could still have a, a, you know, a church that speaks Ukraine for the Ukrainians. But there should be one bishop in the city. Mm -hmm. Right. That was only the, that's the vision of Christ. And everybody should pray for the same bishop. You could have the two parishes because if it's too big or there's languages issues, but there should be the same bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I spoke about how <clears throat> there's kind of a spectrum of Catholics now. Yes. And uh, the church that my family belongs to in Pennsylvania is very much, uh, uh, you know, he has Latin mass, he does high masses uh, often. Yeah. And I know there's a group, the name of them escapes me right now, but they, uh, they're they very traditional. Yeah. Is there an agenda, is there, or is there some kind of organization that, on the Catholic side, that is uh, wanting to kind of, uh, you know, the Pope has come out and said, no more high masses, and they're, right. they're, there's a backlash to that. Yeah. Are they wanting to do this uh, reunification with the Orthodox Church that you know of? You know, I think that um, the tragedy is that when the, the schism took place, that nobody seemed to really care. Like, you know, it was like, well, well goodbye, Rome, you know, and, and uh, it, it remains a problem. Now, I think the issue is that it, to have unity, you must have a sense of, of unity that already exists. You must feel like, we're the same, why are we separated? But in fact, if worship is so different, that it looks like a different kind of religion of sorts, or it really feels different, 
Then people are going to say, yeah, let's reunite because it doesn't even feel the same. I would say that uh, before Vatican II, you know, the, especially the, the, the crazy mass and stuff that we see, it felt kind of the same. I mean, you could go to a Latin mass, okay, sure, it, it was more like medieval Europe, but it, it had the same feel. It wasn't the same general experience. But I was just showing to my son a, uh, an extreme case of a modern day Catholic mass uh, where it's just a whole different thing. Like, you, you, you can't, you know, can't be late. So, um, so yeah, the, the, the path has been kind of, you know, separating. Now, theologians have, have written wonderful agreements, you know, complex language about the filioque way, and I guess, but the people have to say, we're, we're, we're the same. And, and, and suddenly that is not. Now you could say, well, the world is so anti-Christian that aren't Christians going to feel the same? I mean, with all this kind of uh, sense of, you know, I think, yes, that's, that could help. You know, when you're in a gulag, you don't really care if you know, you know, if you're Christians in the gulag together, you're going to feel a, a pretty strong unity. You know? People have to want it. You know? People like their little world. But I wrote the book to offer, I think, you know, a, a pathway that I think is, is authentic, you know. And yes, having a liturgy that, that feels the same it would, be, would be important. Yes? I was wondering if you think these defects you're talking about, aren't they really just the workings of the devil, um, creating divisions, and even just changes? Is Jesus' birthday December, which that could have the 10th month, or is it the solstice? Or I'm surprised there's not more divisions, but don't you think these changes in the mind virus that the Caesars had that installed around Augustus Augustus and Julius, August and July? Everything well, so you know, there's a lot of bad scholarship on that. I think the only way to really know what really happened is to read the primary source. Right? So a lot of people think, oh, um, you know, uh, uh, birth of Christ was moved to December 25 because there was already a, uh, some kind of a feast there of the Romans, Saturnalia. That's just not true. A lot of you know anti-Catholic literature. Uh, was just very poorly sourced. Some of the books, like uh, The Two Babylon by His Love, there's nothing, it's not, there's nothing accurate in the book. You know, when the, the feast of the birth of Christ, there was a debate whether it was January 6, December 25. Now, we can actually kind of compute the birth of Christ because uh, we know that uh, John the Baptist was six months before Christ. We know when his father was serving in the temple. So we have different possible you know, ways to... And John Chrysostom, when he allowed the feast to be served in Constantinople in the what, year 386 and all that, okay, he said he, there was a question about the date. He, he checked with the Romans, their sources, and, the, this, and then he said, yes, I think that's a credible date. And if you think of it that way, it means that that Christ would have been conceived on March 25, which is just about the day he was dying. Then, then he died. So he would have died the day that he was conceived. So there's a lot of, you know, and also the, the solar theme of Christ is in the Bible. The Son of Righteousness, the Bridegroom, and the Son. So, you know, uh, he must increase, I must decrease six months before the two feasts. And there is a solar symbolism in the Bible that is very strong which works with uh, December 25, June 25, March 25 Annunciation. So it, it is a very consistent picture, and the, the Romans did not have a feast uh, before that at that time. Though it's often said. So I think that December 25 is a good date to celebrate Christmas. Yeah. Okay, on this I'll let you go. <laughs> uh, and I'll see you uh, in two weeks, and Vespers next Tuesday.